Welcome to That's Good Sports. I am Brandon. Thank you for suggesting the Broncos' most handsomest quarterback ever, Joe Flacco, is starting to look like me, Perna. The 49ers defeated the Broncos 24-15 on Monday Night Football's booger-fueled broadcast for preseason ball. Today, I will recap that game and discuss what worked, what didn't work, and why the 49ers may have the toughest kickoff specialist in the league. Sure, the Denver Broncos have Brandon McManus, the gooch splitter who showed up to the game dressed like Freddie Mercury, making him entirely responsible for this being the hottest kickoff in Broncos history at 95 degrees. That's why they call him Mr. Fahrenheit, cause he's kicking at the speed of light. But it was San Fran's Mitch Wishnowski from Australia who stole the show. And just like the alarming number of bugs and animals that can kill you down under, if you're a return man, you're gonna wish Nowski that a kicker just didn't obliterate you while you're trying to make an NFL roster. Let's get sports. Please, if you're new, subscribe to this YouTube channel. I do football videos all week, every week, till the day I'm dead. Also, quick shout out for uh, Tyler from Bad Daddy's Burgers. Tyler, thanks for hooking me up. Thank you, Tyler. Also, this episode is sponsored by Manscaped. It doesn't matter where you shave, it matters how you shave. The number one place for total body maintenance is manscaped.com. As a man with the ability to grow hair on any part of my body that's thicker than the jungles in the Amazon basin, I have put the lawnmower 2.0 through the ringer. It is my favorite manscaping tool and I recommend you try the perfect package 2.0 plus peak hygiene plan. It comes with the lawnmower, the plow, the crop preserver, the crop reviver, the pube mat, and a free travel storage bag, and a replacement blade for your lawnmower every three months for just $14.99. If you're already manscaping, definitely check out their new replenishment plans, where you choose the frequency of delivery so you never run out of your favorite product. Use my promo code GOODSPORTS or the link in the description to save 20% off your manscaped order. There was clearly only one appropriate way to start this episode. Fuck! <laughs> yeah, there she was. The first in-game fuck of the season that I have heard. Fuck! I will never, ever not find that funny. And I know this may be a bit premature, but I think Drew Locke was born to play under center. Why else would ESPN show this close-up of him gently sliding his hand down the crack of Connor McGovern's ass? This is the number one reason the NFL ratings will skyrocket this season. The NFL is always on the cutting edge of technology and have now added video cameras to the top and bottom of the down markers for first down and spot reviews in an effort to prove that no matter how much video evidence they have, the referees will still fuck up the call. Next season, I hope the NFL installs a camera that makes Jimmy Garoppolo look less attractive. The current NFL cameras certainly are not equipped to hide the fact that Jimmy G played terrible in his return. Let me be clear though, Jimmy Garoppolo played the worst game I have ever seen any quarterback play in a game as important as this. Everything was his fault, his career is over, and he should fucking retire, become a model, and just wait for Tom Brady to leave Giselle for him. What other choice does he have after nearly throwing a pick six to a guy who was in the AAF a few months ago? It is all over for Jimmy. At some point, when you keep mentioning that Jimmy G had a zero QBR and went one for six, it should set in that that's all it was, six passing attempts. His first six passes in live game action in the last 11 months. Keep in mind, every time he steps back to pass, he's probably thinking, well, goddamn, I'm handsome. But also, I hope my knee doesn't betray me again. Returning from that kind of injury takes a little bit of time for that confidence to rebuild. It also didn't help that he kept getting chubbed. Bradley Chubb was definitely in mid-season form with three tackles, a sack, a forced fumble, and two quarterback hits. Chubb's strip came against a tackle named School. Really struggling between a you got schooled joke or a skull fuck joke. 
The opening series uh, for the Denver defense was perfect. Shelby Harris swatted Jimmy G's first pass, and then Chubb came in with the pressure after embarrassing Joe Staley, which set up the Isaac Yadam interception. Von Miller believes Bradley Chubb will be an improved edge rusher this season. All I can say is if you're edging a Chubb, it's going to explode onto the scene at some point. For the Broncos, here's my good and bad, starting with the bad because you never want the good news first, unless the good news is that there is no longer any bad news. The run game looked rusty, probably like the inside of a decade old Antonio Brown helmet. Brown. The run game struggled because the offensive line was ineffective. I mean, Kevin Hogan and Emmanuel Sanders were the Broncos' leading rushers for the game. My real concern is special teams and the Broncos' complete ineptitude through three games to cover returns and to simply catch punts. River Craycraft had a seven-yard punt return and it felt like a huge win. It felt like it was worth celebrating. The lone bright spot, of course, on special teams is Brandon McManus, who didn't seem to be under pressure as he will rock the gooch like a killer queen all season long until every Broncos opponent bites the dust. Three of three on field goals in the first half, plus he split a 52 yarder down the gooch. I'd also like to see the Broncos offense start finishing some of the nice drives they're putting together with, you know, touchdowns. Last year, they only had two opening drive touchdowns, which had to have been the worst or close to it in the NFL. So there's still some concern in this area. The good news, the good for the Broncos was Shelby Harris. He was so good. Jesus Christ, Shelby, what are, what are, what have you, what have you been eating this off season? Shelby, who again, loves the fact that I look like Jack from This Is Us, batted a pass, tipped a pass, and stopped a dump off pass for no gain. Shelby Harris may be the best shot blocker in Denver since Dikembe Mutombo. He was everywhere, and I have a feeling he will break the bank this coming offseason, so hopefully the Broncos are smart enough to extend him midseason and not let him hit the free agency market. If I told you Emmanuel Sanders tore his Achilles last season, you wouldn't believe me. He looks spry and fast with a nice end around. He also made an impressive catch on the sideline, which the refs were too blind to count as a catch, and also was the only recipient of a true deep ball thrown in this game by the Broncos. That Flacco Sanders connect was of course called back by a Garrett Bowles holding penalty. Is this going to be a metaphor for how the season goes? Joke's on you, because I don't know what a metaphor is. Also, to be fair to Bowles, he played pretty good outside of that one penalty. Cortland Sutton was finally on the field long enough to get involved in the passing game. Flacco fired a laser in the middle to Sutton for a big conversion in the first. I thought both Sutton and Deshaun Hamilton played pretty well. Sure, each guy only had two catches, but they were key catches, and I think both of Hamilton's came on third down. Wide receiver depth is a concern heading into the season. Unless, of course, those guys continue to step up, which it looks like they might do. San Francisco may now have the most crowded backfield in the league. Jarek McKinnon still isn't ready after tearing his ACL last preseason. I'm not sure why the 49ers would keep him on the roster unless his injury forbids them from cutting him, even though they are technically in an out year for his contract. Between Tevin Coleman, Matt Breda, and Raheem Mostert, uh, who made his case to be the starter last night, Kyle Shanahan has plenty of weapons to work with in the backfield. I mean, Mostert destroyed the Broncos' second and third team defenders and ended the night as the leading rusher and receiver for the 49ers. I also like this wide receiver, Kendrick Bourne, who bounced back after dropping a perfect deep pass that slipped through his arms like he sat next to this guy on the sideline. When a young player makes a mistake, you want to see them bounce back, and Bourne did that, making a great catch in the corner of the end zone that we will now call the Bourne Contested. Let me tell you something I did not like, though. ESPN's graphics and editing, in addition to reusing the dumb QB carousel graphic where every former Broncos quarterback looks like they just got released from prison and the last place they should be hanging out is on a child's carousel, they also edited the intro to this game like a horror film. The preseason. We gotta stop the tempo and physicality right now. For some, it's time to show up. 
Are they implying this season will be a horror show for Broncos and 49ers fans? It's not even Halloween yet, so this was odd. An anonymous artistic choice. An artistic choice I appreciated, though, was seeing Chris Harris Jr. blitzing from the corner. This is why we brought in Vic Fangio, so Harris can get back into the NFL Top 100 by leading the league in sacks. Sorry, Bradley Chubb. Strap Harris is your number one competition for sacks this season, not Von Miller. Drew Locke looked the same as he did last week. No better, no worse. Made some nice throws, but still has a lot to work on. He did injure his thumb in the game, which did not look painful at all. And you know his injury didn't occur by accidentally getting his thumb stuck up the center star hole by aggressively getting his hands up under there. Locke's thumb has been labeled as a bad sprain. Luckily though, Noah Fant's ankle injury has been labeled as a minor injury. The 49ers have a player named Contavious Street. Or Contavious Street. Which sounds like a terrible street to drive down. Like the kind of street that's difficult to navigate, has potholes, and always causes you and your wife to become argumentative in the car. Their mood switched to a Contavious one after the couple disagreed about the best route to take to a dinner party. Personally, I will feel Contavious if the 49ers' Sean Poindexter does not make the final 53-man roster. And finally, Booger McFarland told Philip Lindsay the only way to become a man is to buy a house and probably go into debt. The first thing I'll tell him, though, it's time for you to move out of the house with your parents. Get your, get your mortgage, young man. But now you got to transition to being an adult, be, being a grown man. But Lindsay owned him by saying, Philip. What's up with living at home still? Oh, it is, it's, it's for different purposes right now. We got the lockout maybe coming up soon, so I gotta be cautious. Great answer, Philip. But I believe you should have said, I'm not taking real estate advice from a guy who got evicted from a flying bleacher seat last year and who also goes by the name Booger. Booger. Philip Lindsay needs to be a man and buy a house, but you still want to be called Booger on television? Come on, man. You just got moss. Thanks for watching another episode of That's Good Sports. Please subscribe here on YouTube. Share this video with your friends. I'm on Twitter, Instagram, at Brandon Perna. Uh, also share this video with your enemies. I don't give a shit. Just, you really gotta ask yourself if they will hate or like what they just saw. Also, at Wilkie6, my writing partner. Give him some love on Twitter as well.